Do you know what an epidemiologist is? Is it a, a skin doctor? No, of course, I'm not a skin doctor. What is an epidemiologist? What do we do? Someone who look into the data. But there's a statistician. So as an epidemiologist, we concentrate a lot on looking into data, as you say, looking into correct way to collect data, interpret the data, analyze the data, and interpret the data correctly. I'm now a faculty member in Yumi University in Sweden. I guess all of you know Sweden, or at least you know where it is. Uh, in a small city called Umeå, if you see, it's an A but with a circle on the top. So we call it as O instead of A. And I'll show some facts to you, and I'll give you some challenges for you to think of in the coming two years until you have to write your thesis. And probably if you're interested to do research on chronic disease and aging, you can think of some interesting topics to study. That's my email. If you have questions about this lecture, most welcome to write to me. I'm a proud graduate of Gajamada Medical University, uh, Gajamada University Faculty of Medicine. I graduated in 1999. Then I took my master degree, as well as my PhD degree in epidemiology, both in Sweden at Yumi University. It's not so far away, actually, from from Indonesia, if you see this short line, probably around, I don't know, maybe one meter long. I flew here and it took me about probably, I don't know, maybe 18 hours, including all the transit. And it's only 2,800 hours walking, if you want to walk there. <laughs> from Bundaran, you take the second exit and turn left to Siman Juntak and then turn right onto Sudirman Street and who knows you ends where. <laughs> yeah. It's very up not close to the Arctic Circle, so we have quite a lot of nice view. It's a small city. Very small city, one hundred and fifty thousand no probably one hundred and twenty thousand right now in terms of population size. And this is the university. Uh, if Gajamada has the logo, we also have the logo type. And can anyone guess what this is? What this represents? Ice? No. Ice doesn't look like this. That is not ice. That is this. You see the light? It's northern light. So we are so close to the Arctic Circle and we can see the northern light. Actually, when there was there, there was a solar explosion last week, very big solar activity, and we had experienced nice solar, I mean, northern light appearance. Anyone who knows the Latin word for northern light? <coughs> Piles of snow, but people still cycling to work. Can you imagine cycling to work on minus 20, 35 degree? So this is where I base. Uh, we have the Yumi International School of Public Health. That is a graduate program for master level as well as the doctoral level. We don't have undergraduate level, but we have a few of your colleagues, students from the Faculty of Medicine, who have visited Yumi University and worked in this hospital. This is the main hospital. They went to the International School of Public Health. We have just got new students this year new academic year, we have 55 students from all around the world. Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe and America, as well as Australia, as far as Australia. So we have quite interesting mixed group of students taking their Master of Public Health degree. So, my topic will focus on two things, as I mentioned. Have you seen this movie? Can you tell us in brief what this is about? Let me, yeah, I would like you to participate. Anyone can point and just say something, just in brief.
Born as a baby with old people appearance, and then he experienced reverse aging. He became younger and younger as he grows. Is it possible in our world? Aging is a process, isn't it? Have you aged already? Yes, we have aged since we were born. Since we were, uh, I mean, when my, our mother was pregnant, we have aged since the very first second. So aging is a process, and unfortunately, aging is not a reversible process, not as what we have seen in this movie. We will certainly grow older and older, but not younger and younger. Is aging a problem already in the world? If you go, some of you are from Malaysia, if you go out, do you still see a lot of young children playing around? Some of you are from some part of Indonesia, when you go out, do you still see a lot of young children? Yes, probably yes, because there are still a lot of young children around. But in many high developed countries, there are not so many children anymore because the population is aging and we have seen a lot of older people. Like in Sweden, if I go out, I don't see children playing around, but I see a lot of old people walking around. They are cycling, they are jogging, or they are even driving cars at 80 years old. So the world is aging. But on the x-axis are the percentages. On the y-axis are the ages. So if we look at the first bar over here, age 0 to 5, there were 6% among female and about 7% among male. So 7% of all males in the world, they were around 0 to 5 years old. The next age group, 5 to 10 years old, for 11 to 14, and so on. <coughs> So we see that we have a higher, a larger base of the pyramid. This is a pyramid and we have a larger base. It's quite broad. And this is a typical population structure in developing countries where we have a lot of young children. Do you agree? So if we have a wide base like this, very wide, 6%, 5%, 5%, 4%, and so on. These are all the young people. For example, um, all these four bars shows everyone below 20 years old. Everyone between 20 to 60, for example, all these bars. And there were only a few people who lived up to 100 years old. That was in 1950. But if we move the clock, by 2010, the population structure changed already. And what's, the, what's your observation? The base become narrower and narrower, isn't it? Which means that there were less children who were born. And in epidemiological term, we say that the total fertility rate decreased. Because of the total fertility rate decreased, there were not so many newborn children that we have a narrower base. But as you see over here, if I move between these two, this is before and this is by 2010, what we see is that there's a bigger expansion of this part, which actually means there were more and more old people. And this, will, this is how it looks like in about 30 years time. We see a narrower base and then a larger upper part also. And this is how the world will look like by the end of this century. Okay, almost look like a tomb instead of a pyramid. And this is how Sweden population looked like by 1950, 2010, 2050, and by the end of the century. So we see over here, there are a lot, a lot of old people over here. What's the problem if people, uh, the population grow older? What's the problem if the population grow older in a country? Isn't it good, isn't it good that people live longer? Come on, say something, yes, please. They are not productive, that is very good. What is the pension age in Malaysia? 60. What's the pension age in Indonesia? 
yeah, 65, 55, probably. Imagine in Indonesia, no one have, I mean, only small proportion of the population have health insurance. Even for yourself, if you think of yourself, if you're sick, if you go to the hospital, do you have to put your hand inside, inside your pocket? Isn't it? You have to pay out of your pocket. Health expenditure in many parts of Asian countries are out of pocket expenditure. So you have to pay by yourself. Imagine old people who don't have income. Where do, where do they supposed to get their money from? So they become independent of the young people. In countries like Sweden, it's also a problem. Even though healthcare is free, or almost free in Sweden. I work in Sweden, if I got sick, I just pay small amount of money. I don't pay at all for all the examinations. Small amount of money for drugs. Up to a certain level, it's covered by the government because I pay high tax. If people pay around maybe 10, 15% of income tax here, in Sweden we pay about 30 to 40. For some people who, who are high earner, they even pay 55% of their income. Where do all this money go? It came back to us as healthcare expenditure for education. I pay nothing for my children to go to school, nothing. They got the books, they got the meals. And imagine that in, in a country where we have huge number of old people like that. Slide. This slide show the proportion of population over 65 in two parts of the world, the developed world and the developing world. And we see a huge increase of population over 65 from around 8% to 26% in the developed world almost three times, a bit over three times. But in developing worlds, we see a significant progress also from 4% up to 15% by 2050. So this projection is quite true, and even it could be worse, actually, that people live longer and there are a larger number of older populations. Imagine if we don't have health insurance. Fortunately, that Indonesians start to use BPGS. And I believe you all hear about the BPGS already which was enrolled in the, the 1st of January 2014, which are supposed to cover the whole population by 2019. Imagine if that doesn't exist. If we got sick in our, during our old age, where are we supposed to get the money from to cover the health expenditure? So the, 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 the main message here is that the world is aging. And why I say that everywhere in the world, I compare these four different countries, quite big countries, China, India, Indonesia, and South Africa. This was how their population structure looked like by 1950. You see quite similar pattern. It was a pyramid, it was pyramid structure, isn't it? We have very high base over here, a lot of young children playing around in all this part of the world. And this was how it looked like by 2010. We see that the population structure, the young population string and the old population grow. And quite interesting to see that the structure quite similar in most of the countries, except in China. You see this cleft over here. Why doesn't the Chinese population structure look like this, a smooth progression like this, but more like this with a cleft? Can anyone hypothesize what it was? Think about Chinese history back 20, 30 years ago. What was the driver of that cleft? Very good, one child policy. So by 1780, the Chinese government, because of the population explosions, they introduced forcefully the policy of one child, which means that you are not allowed to have your second child. Otherwise, you got to be punished, I think. So that was a problem. By then, there was a, quite a big decrease in the number of young people, and therefore, you see this cleft. This was 2010, and by 2010, they were about 30 years old, which actually means they were born in the 1980s, 1970, 1980s. So the, in 1970s, 80s, there were very large decrease in the number of young population who were born during that year. Okay, but still, it's a problem. I mean, aging is a problem in this part of the world also. We see a larger proportion over here. This is how it would look like in 2050. 
quite an anomaly over here. And this is by the end of the century, uh, 2100. And the line shows the median age. Everyone know what median is? Yeah, yeah. Median means that half of the population in this country, in Indonesia, half of this population, they will be above 45 years old, and the remaining half will be around or below 40, 45 years old. So that's the median age. By the end of the century, actually, most countries in the world have almost similar median age. So it will be quite similar. And population aging will be a significant problem by the end of this century. It's not a new issue, actually. It has been recognized by, for example, Business Week back in 2005 already, posing this as a main topic, global aging. Uh, this is quite messy. Yeah, here. In Japan, for example, in 1975, they were, the median age was 30 years old. By 2000, it increased up to 41. By 2025, it's projected to be 50 years old. Back in 1975, when the, mean age, the median age was uh, 20, uh, sorry, 30, there were 12 pensioners among 100 workers over here. So it means that for 100, 100 persons who work, there were 12 pensioners who need to be taken care of. And if we see over here, by the end of the, by the, end of the 2020, there will be another 50. So out of 100 workers, they need to support another 50 retiring. So it's quite a significant problem. And this is not only a problem for big country like Japan, but also a pro problem for most of the developed countries, even for developing countries south, such as South Africa. So even in South Africa where the people die because of HIV AIDS, still the population is aging and they are facing this problem also. So I'll show this graph, the, the development of the median age of the population in selected countries. We have China, India, Indonesia, Sweden and South Africa. Uh, with Sweden as a front runner. By the year 1950, their median age was about 34 years old. While in many parts of the Asia, Asian country, it's still around 21 to 24. That was when we start to got independence from uh, the other countries. So when we see the progressions, uh, the first line is Sweden, the second line here is China. China kept up quite quickly with a significant increase in their median age during about 40, 45 years old, from less than 20, 22, up to about 35 years old. If we project this line, if this growth continues, when do you think China will catch up with Sweden? So you have the axis over there. This is how it looked like. By 2030 already, the median age in China will be similar of that in Sweden. So half of their population will be above and below that certain age. And if you continue to project this line for Indonesia, when do you think Indonesia will catch up with Sweden? I think you are quite right. It's by 2055. So we'll have quite similar uh, median age. And by the end of the century, this is how it will look like. So as we, see, uh, as we saw earlier, almost every country in the world will have about the similar median age. So this is to illiterate, uh, to literate, iterate that it's not a problem for high income country, but also a problem for low income country also. And the problem is, in high-income country, that process took decades to develop. In Sweden, this is quite a complicated graph, I'm sorry for this. In Sweden, it took Sweden 85 years to double their 65 years old population from 7 to 14 percent. Do you know what I mean? So to, to double their 65 plus population from 7 percent to 14 percent, it took Sweden 85 years. It took France even longer, over one century. 
it took UK 45 years. But look at Singapore. It took Singapore only 19 years to double their 65 plus population from 7 to 14 percent. Some of you live very close to Singapore. If you go to Singapore, if you land at Changi Airport, if you want to take your luggage, if you want to take your trolley, whom do you meet? Elderly people, they are walking around with all the trolleys. They are pensioners, they don't have work, they have to get money to support themselves, unfortunately most of the time, probably without a lot of support from their family member, unfortunately. So this will become a social problem in long term, as well as for Indonesia. I bet we will probably end up with Singapore, how Singapore looks like, if we, if we don't uh, conserve our family value. Right now, I think no one sees this as a problem because as children, we are supposed to take care of our parents. But imagine if the social value changes when you grow older, become a, a grandpa or grandma. Do you think that your grandchildren will still take care of you? That's an open question for us to answer. So a lot of things will change in the next few decades. So the main message from this slide is that Everything in developing countries happen much, much, much faster. The good news is that people in developing countries, they have become healthier, 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 and they live longer. That's, of course, a good news. But what is the bad news? There's always two sides of a coin. What's the bad news of that? Significant progression in short period of time. to take care of old people. Have you been to Puskesmas, the primary health care center? From your observation, just imagine there are five old people who need help because they got stroke. They have limp, I mean, they are limping, they cannot walk. They go to the primary health care and say, can you give me something so I can walk properly? Do you think Puskesmas will be able to give something to them? Probably not, and maybe absolutely not at this stage. So that's the problem. I mean, we don't have all these countries where things change very quickly. We don't have enough time to prepare ourselves to take care of those burdens. And the very close example, as I mentioned, in Singapore, what are the government's actions for old people? Why do they need to work at the airports, to the food courts? Who do you think are serving you? Who do you think are taking away all the plates from your table? Old people, isn't it? If we imagine, do we want our parents to work like that? I don't think anyone first will say yes to that question. Simply because government do not have any exit plan, an urgent plan to take care of old people. That will certainly happen to some of these countries also. So the learning objective, I come to the learning objective quite late. And this is like James Bond's movie. You see the action first and then come the title. <laughs> so we talk about the demographic transitions. We talk about the world is aging, the population is aging. But what's the problem with the old people? One of the problem with old people is because they are more prone to chronic diseases. They are more susceptible to chronic diseases and we are going to talk about risk factor also, and I would like to pose some research question for you to answer. If you're interested to do public health research, I know some of you will go to clinical research, some of you will go to biomolecular research, but I guess some of you are interested in public health issue. You don't want to sit in the laboratory to look at your microscope. You don't want to sit waiting for your patients one by one, but you want to do something bigger for the populations. That is what public health is concerned of. What we do are something for the whole population. We are not dealing with individual patients. We are not dealing with individual microscope observations. But we are dealing with the community issue. What do you think is the world is the most or the largest issue, public health issue in Indonesia? Just name one. You, anyone can name anything. Smoking. Oh, what do you think is the largest? Just one. 
Well, take random, yeah. HIV? <laughs> Ebola, no. <laughs> There's no Ebola, hopefully, yet. I like movies, that's why I use movie slides a lot. Uh, someone want to say something about this? In brief, very brief. Have you seen this movie? Okay. Yeah. Have you jumped into the end? <laughs> Hazel Grace Lancaster and August, Augustus Water. What does Hazel have? What? It was not a primarily lung cancer. It was a lung cancer which metastasized from thyroid cancer. So the primary site of the cancer was in thyroid. It was then metastasized to the lung. So I was quite interested to look into the burden of thyroid cancer in the world. And for all of you, when you are going to write your script, see, your thesis, I think this is a good website for you to visit. A cancer actually here. So you can put the indicator, you can select for Indonesia, you can select for the whole world, Asia, Africa. You can try to estimate the prevalence as what I did. So this graph shows the prevalence per 100,000 populations. The prevalence of thyroid cancer in the world per 100,000 population. Let's take Australia. Very dark over here. It says it's about 9.3 plus. So in Australia, there were 9.3 plus patient, thyroid patient cancer, a thyroid uh, cancer patient per 100,000 population. So this is kind of high burden country. Similar to Russian, some part of Europe, Americans and South Americans. But in Indonesia, if we look at the color over here, it's about this level probably. So about two to five thyroid cancer patients per 100,000 population. It's not so high burdens. But do you think thyroid cancer is the main killer of the world, of female in the world? Of course, uh, Hazel did not die. August, Augustus died because of osteosarcom. But what is the main killer for female in the world? You have a very good guess. So the next graph I saw over here is I look into the breast cancer or not the breast cancer only, but the most common cancer sites among females in the world. And you see all over the world, it's almost dark red. And when you look at the legend, dark red is breast cancer. So breast cancer is the main killer, or was the main killer in Indonesia, in Australia, in China, many parts of the world. But also in some countries, you can see some yellow color over here liver cancer. I think this is probably Laos. Laos. Okay. So quite interesting. You can develop this graph by yourself also. You just go to the website, select the indicator, you get a nice graph. It's very good for the introduction of your thesis. It will make your, your tutor or your supervisor impressed with your capability to produce nice graph, I think. And what about men? What do, actually, what do men die of, actually? Yeah, prostate cancer in some part of the world. And in many parts, many countries over here, it's lung cancer. So what caused lung cancer? Smoking has been accused or has been proven as the leading cause of lung cancer, of course. So that's among men. And the next graph over here shows all the burden of all the world population who died, so these are everyone who died in the world, the largest proportion of the causes here was cardiocirculatory diseases. Example like stroke, okay, heart failure, hypertensive heart diseases and so on. Some of them, they, were, they died because of cancer over here. I'm sorry, this is quite small. You probably cannot see the legend. But I tell you, these are cardiovascular diseases. These are cancer. So if you see 40 to 70, 30% of the world population die because of cardiovascular diseases. Another probably 15% die of cancer. And some die of HIV, diarrhea, acute respiratory, or lower respiratory infections, and so on. And if we look at, or we stratify these results by men and women, to your left, that's men. To your right, that's women. The pattern looks quite similar. So we can somehow say that cardiovascular disease is the main killer in the world. 
So when we look at, we group all these different diseases, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, we group them together as what we call as non-communicable diseases or chronic diseases. That's the topic of my lecture today, chronic diseases. We call them chronic diseases because they have certain characteristics, which I will show in the next slides. So we group them in, into three different big categories. And this is how WHO has have grouped all the diseases. Some people die of infectious diseases or maternal related diseases, hemorrhage during delivery, for example, or neonatal infections or malnutrition, for example. So there were about 25% of the world population die of infectious diseases. 10% die of injury because they are speeding, violence, a war in Mediterranean, for example. So of all of those different causes, they account for 10% of all deaths in the world. But what is amazing here is we actually see almost 66% of the world population die of chronic diseases. And what do we mean by chronic diseases? There are four main types of chronic diseases. As we said earlier, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes. It's a, a big problem already now in Indonesia. Can you like to, you to close your eyes for a while? I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to reflect. Just close your eyes. Trust me, I'm not going to do anything. Close your eyes. I would like you to think of one of your friends, neighbor, family member, close family, relatives who have had chronic disease of all those different kinds. With chronic disease among your family, friends, raise your hand. Okay, now you can open your eyes and see who raised the hand. Are there many? Yeah, quite many, I think. Isn't it? If we do the count, I think I would say probably around 70% of you raise your hand. It's not a problem of high income country. You see it in your neighborhood. You see it probably maybe close friends. You see it in your working place, someone who has chronic diseases. It's certainly not a problem of high income country. It's our problem already. But the question to you is, do you know that the government have taken any action on those? Observe, do observe when you go to a primary health care center. What kind of drugs do people get? What do, what do people get at primary health care center usually? Antibiotics for a few days, maybe? OK. Uh, paracetamol, vitamin, vitamin A, B, C, and whatever vitamin. Think about a hypertensive patient. And all people 65 years old come to primary health care center and being diagnosed with hypertension. What do you think the doctor or the pharmacist will give that patient? Antihypertensive drug. Will that patient get a box of drug? How many tablets do you think he will get? Ten, let's say ten. And what will the doctor say to the patient? Come back again after this drug is finished. You think he will come back? Think about urban area, rural area. If you need to take a bus to the closest primary health care center, and it will take you one hour, and you have to pay 2,000 rupiah, you think this poor old man will come back? He will not come back. So what we will have is a lot of uncontrolled hypertension. People have hypertension, but they are not controlled with any drug. And what's the complication of having uncontrolled hypertension? Stroke. You can have renal failure because of the destruction of the renal structure. So that's a problem. The problem with chronic disease is not the chronic disease itself, uh, but it's the long duration from exposure to become disease. That's an old story. Tell me another story. What else can smoking cause? Smoking can cause addiction. Smoking can cause lung cancer. Do you know that smoking can cause diabetes? 
Do you know smoking can cause tuberculosis? Do you know smoking can cause uh, cataract also? Smoking can cause a lot of diseases in our body, in the organ of our body. But if I smoke today, if I smoke now, will I see the cataract, will I see the heart disease tomorrow? No. That's a problem. When you go to your KKN or to your Puskesmas, when you try to give information to the, fam uh, to the community, you say, don't smoke because smoking will kill you. And probably the community will say, I'm still healthy. Because they do not see the effect between the exposure and the outcome. Smoking being exposed, heart disease or diabetes being the outcome. So there's quite a long duration. That is what we call as lag periods between the exposure and outcome. That's a long period for all chronic diseases. For heart disease also. If we say, for example, lack of physical activity is a, a risk factor for heart disease. If I sit today for the whole day, I'm not going to get heart disease tomorrow. It will come maybe in two decades. Okay, so that's a problem with chronic diseases. It's, it's a slow progression and long duration. Who have lost one of the legs? Another story, Roberto, 52 years old, Brazilian a stroke survivor. Can you guess how many children he has? How many grandchildren he has? When he got stroke, who are going to be the breadwinner? Who are going to provide money, to gain money, to have income for the whole family? Isn't it a problem? So chronic disease is not only the problem for the patient, it's a problem for the family member. It's a problem for the country also, because he, he will certainly need health care. And in this book, you can read that he did not even have a wheelchair. So they have to make a chair for him, not with wheels, so he could not move around. So it's quite a problem. It creates disability among people. And unfortunately, most of the time among young, productive people. We have heard a lot in the last year, quite many actors, they die of chronic diseases. Name a few, let's name a few. Say something about Ajima Said. Isn't it? Yeah, Krishya has lung cancer. And probably you have seen this also. We lost our health minister, even. Can you guess, or not guess, probably, can you hypothesize how did she get the lung cancer? Secondhand smoking kills. That is a new science. We did not know hand smoking kills until the 90s. Do you remember, probably you haven't seen, there are a lot of, if you go to YouTube, if you type US doctor cigarette, you will be exposed to a lot of advertisement where doctors become the model for cigarette. They promote cigarette to be used. That was 1950. Before we know actually smoking is has, it's harmful. So 10 years later, when we know smoking is harmful, that advertisement was abolished. And now we know that actually smoking is, I mean, not good for the smokers, as well as for the non-smoker who are in the surrounding area. So secondhand smoking, secondhand smoke kills. And if you go around the city, it's very easy for you to see a lot of smokers around, isn't it? It's quite easy for you to see um, a man, a father, who hold the child on the right hand and smoke with the left hand. It's not an uncommon view. So I think as a medical doctor, future medical doctor, one of your responsibilities is to educate your patient that you have to quit smoking. But everything has to start small, I think. Everything has to start small. You have to take a small step. So you have to quit by yourself if you still smoke. <coughs> You have to tell your friend, your next door neighbor, to quit if, you, if they still smoke. So start small. We, I was part of this project, Quit Tobacco Indonesia. Maybe you have heard about that project back in 2003. 
When we start talking about smoke-free campus, I, I think you have a lot of signs around the campus, smoke-free campus. There are quite a lot of oppositions. But we move on, start small with one campus. We established the smoking cessation clinic in the lung clinic, close to the Bantul area. If you go to that, the, the southern part of uh, yeah, this side probably, Jogja, you see a lung, lung clinic with smoking cessation clinic. When we talk about that, I mean, people did not believe us. How could that happen in Indonesia? We talk about smoking cessation where everyone smoked. But eventually, small thing happens, and it trigger big things, bigger and bigger things. We start with one clinic, and soon that was expanded to six other clinics. Soon it was expanded to all primary health care in Yogyakarta City, all primary health care in Yogyakarta City, and then diabetes clinic in the hospital, and so on. So have, they have reached critical mass already, but everything does start small. I think that is quite important for us to understand. So my question to you, we live longer, but do we live healthier? That's quite a big question, actually. We don't actually know, even for Sweden, we don't actually know. The life expectancy increased significantly, but do people live healthier? Let's assume this scenario. Life expectancy was 75 years old. And that specific person at specific age start to have the disability or illness at 60 years old, which actually means that that person or that person, or person in this age group, they will need to stay another 15 years before they die of the disease with disability. Do you understand what I mean? If that person got stroke at age 60 and died in 675, that means that that person has to live 15 years old with the stroke. And the scenario is that now we live longer. Suppose that in a country life expectancy increased from 75 to 80 years old, which actually means people live longer, but if we don't postpone the disability to kick in, if still people got the disability or got the stroke at 60 years old, we actually increase the suffering, isn't it? They will, be, they will have the disease for a longer period. That is not what we want. That is what is called as extension of morbidity. And that is what I suspect Indonesian is experiencing. Life expectancy increased, but more and more we see younger people got diseases. Younger people got diabetes. Younger people got stroke. Younger people got hypertension and so on. So people live with their disability longer. That's what we call as extension of morbidity. That is my hypothesis. I think Indonesia is experiencing this problem. And believe me or not, in the next 10, 20 years, you will see a lot of young people who die of heart diseases. But maybe in the next 15 years, when we have a good healthcare system, they will not die. They will survive, but with disability. Okay? Let's imagine if someone has stroke at 5 o'clock, yeah, 4 o'clock this time. If you need to drive that person from a specific area to the closest hospital, don't say Sarjito. Let's don't point at Sarjito. It's too close. Or probably it's close enough. You need to drive a patient from here to there. Can you go through the road easily? There will be a lag time. Imagine that someone got stroke in Gunung Kidul and need to go to Sarjito immediately. How do we handle that patient? Most probably that patient will die on site. Okay? So either we have very high mortality rate, but in the next in the next decades, I believe there will be some good health system being developed. In Sweden, if a person who if a person gets stroke very far away, call nine one one. In minutes, they come a helicopter to fetch that person. Okay, as soon as the helicopter arrives, the patient are being stabilized and go into the helicopter. All the measures are being taken already, blood, ECG, and so on, and that is transmitted to the hospital of destinations. So they are preparing the operation room, whatever we they need, and then the patient come with the hospital, and they are being treated. So they are not going to die, but they are going to live with a better quality of life because they are being treated within the window period, the golden period of stroke. So. This is what I hypothesize experience in Sweden, or happen in Sweden. People live longer, but disability come in later. 
So if this ability came in, come in later, then you have a compression of morbidity. The morbidity period is being compressed to a shorter period. And that is what we want. So when we talk about chronic disease, my main question to you, could chronic disease be prevented? You should say yes. Chronic disease can be prevented very easily. How to prevent chronic disease? To know how to prevent chronic disease, you, know to know, you need to know the risk factor of chronic disease. What causes chronic disease? And this, these are all the different risk factors which cause chronic disease. Some biological risk factor, some behavioral risk factor, some environmental risk factor. And all, a lot of these, they could be controlled quite easily. If you think a patient has less physical, inactiv or physical activity, promote physical activity. If you think a patient smoke, ask the patient to quit smoking, and so on. So if we look at this graph, this graph shows the main killer, the main risk factor in the world. Hypertension is a significant problem, tobacco use, cholesterol, low fruit and vegetable intake. High body mass index, physical inactivity, and alcohol. These are the main problems in the world. And it's not a problem in high income country, as illustrated as a blue bar over here, high income country. But it's also a problem in low income country, developing country with low mortality, such as Indonesia, China, and so on. It's also a problem, hypertension is also a problem in low income country with high mortality, like all the countries in Africa. Uh, in Africa and India and South Asia. So it's a problem worldwide, hypertension and tobacco. The, there are always good news and bad news. The good news is that, the bad news first, I start with the bad news. Smoking can cause a lot of things, as I, as I mentioned already. It can cause stroke, diabetes, and so on. But the other side of the coin, the good news is that if you can quit smoking, you can gain benefit by reducing your risk from all those diseases. So that's the message that you need to transmit to your patient, to your friend, to your family. Quit smoking, and then you gain benefit of all these different diseases. As soon as we quit smoking, the risk reduces significantly within the first month. You can Google and find the evidence. So there are a lot of misunderstanding about chronic diseases. Maybe before this lecture, do you think that chronic disease is a problem for Indonesia? Is it a problem for India? Is it a problem for South Africa? Some of you say yes, some of you say no. There's been a lot of misunderstanding that chronic disease is a problem of high income country. That's not true. 80% of all chronic diseases actually located or situated in low middle income country because of the huge population size. Unfortunately, a lot of these big countries, they are low income. China, Indonesia, for example, even though we are moving towards middle income countries. And the, another misunderstanding that Indonesia used to focus on tuberculosis, used to focus on dengue fever, used to focus on malaria. Before you start talking about heart disease, that's completely untrue and that's too late. When you have been able to control all those infectious diseases, you are too late already to control the non-communicable diseases. So another problem is that chronic disease affect mainly old people. Needless to say that we have seen a lot of real examples of actors, actress who die because of chronic disease while they are still very young. It only affects rich people. That is another myth also. That's untrue. It cannot be prevented. There's absolutely we know that to prevent chronic disease, quit smoking, do more physical exercise, eat healthier. It's easier said than done. That's I have to admit, as always, we have to try hard to do that. It's expensive and to control chronic diseases. How much would it cost to quit smoking? Money. You don't need to burn the, the rupiah for cigarette. You actually gain money. It costs nothing. It costs nothing. If you compare quit smoking and chemotherapy for lung cancer, which is more expensive, needless to answer, we know. Absolutely. Okay? You can decide whether you want to smoke or not. If you think of a smoker, why do people start smoking? Before addictions? Friends. Okay? It's a peer pressure. I did my study. 
which I published already now. I did it in Puerto Rico. I talked to uh, children at SMP, the junior high school. I asked them, why do you smoke? A lot of them say, if I don't smoke, I'm not a man. Because everyone else smoke. They even give me an illustration. If I, in a class of 40, 39 students smoke, then the extrapolation, of course, or hyperbolic. But it's quite common when they wake up, they see their, their father smoke at home. I think most of us can still remember people smoke at home. When they step out to go with bus to the school in the rural area, the driver smoke, everyone in the bus smoke. When they reach the school, the teachers are still smoking inside the classroom. So how could you say don't smoke to them? It's very difficult. It's not a lifestyle, it's a peer pressure. So I, I do not believe that it's a lifestyle. It's actually a peer pressure. So can we do something to prevent chronic disease? Yes, you should answer yes. Now let me ask you one more time. Can we do something to prevent chronic disease? I don't hear that. Yeah. yeah, we have to do something. Start from ourselves. If you smoke, if I smoke, I quit smoking. My friends smoke, I ask them to quit smoking. What we need to do are something what we call small thing to achieve large thing. And this is a book by Malcolm Gladwell, the last book which I read, A Tipping Point. As he says in the subtitle here, he presented a lot of example on little things make a big difference. Can we do some small thing which make a big difference? If we have to claim, or if we want to claim the Quit Tobacco Indonesia project, I think that's a tipping point which is not so fast enough. But it's a tipping point. We did, very, we did start very small, now it's spread all over. Facebook is another example in this, in this book. Facebook. It was not created to be used worldwide. It was created to be used inside the campus. But someone leaked it to outsiders, and people like it, and suddenly it became a worldwide phenomenon. So think about something which you can do easily, little, but give a lot of effect. So my challenge to you, if you are interested to do public health research, you don't need to collect your own data. If you want, of course, you are most welcome. But there are a lot of big data sets available freely. You don't need to spend a penny to get the data sets. Go to WHO SAGE website, study on adult health and aging. Go to the Family Life Survey website, apply to use the data, post your research question, and you get the data for free. So that is what we use for our master students. During the last three years, we have uh, supervised around maybe 15 med Master of Public Health student, analyzing this aging data from SAGE. And this is one example. One of my PhD students in Sweden who have just published his paper. He analyzed using the Indonesian Family Life Survey data from many provinces in Indonesia. And he focused on this very interesting issue, which is called the dual burden of malnutrition. What does it mean, the dual burden of malnutrition? Have you seen in a household, you can see an un, a malnourished children, but overweight mother? Okay, one of the family member is malnourished, but the other family member is obese or overweight. So that is what we call dual burden of malnutrition in household. And quite surprising that in Jakarta, we see about 25% of the household could be categorized as the double burden household, where when you go in, you can find one malnourished and one overweight family member. And this is not a, a phenomenon specific to Jakarta only. See this province in eastern part of Indonesia. See, for example, northern part of Sumatra, Yogyakarta, and so on. So it's quite a big problem, the dual burden of malnutrition. But we hypothesize that this is a transitory pattern because it used to be a lot of malnourished people, but now people adapt this, what we call as junk food, then become, they become overweight and so on. But later on, everyone will become overweight, isn't it? If you imagine this process, the malnourished will become normal, the normal will become overweight, and there will be no malnourished people in 10 or 20 years' time. 
So another example which we use the same uh, the aging data set. This is a very interesting data set from six countries. China, Ghana, Mexico, India, Russia, and South Africa. This slide shows the prevalence of disability. We ask the person if they can bend their knee, or if they can run, or if they can walk 100 meters, they can carry grocery, and so on. So this shows the prevalence or the proportion of people who report problem in doing these activities. So as we, say, as we see over here, these are the eight axes. Younger people, older people. And of course, disability increase if we grow older. That's expected. But what we did not expect is to see the gap between men and women. There's a gender gap. Uh, this one is men, the darker one, and the lighter one is women. So the death line, the death line, these are women, and these are men. So my main question to you, who have more disability, men or women? Women. Quite surprising, isn't it? Isn't it that we know that women live longer? Who have a longer life expectancy? Women. Who have a larger proportion of disability? Women. Then you answer my question already. Women live longer but less healthier. That's a big problem. There's a gender gap over there. So I think I skipped the last slide which I saw the proportion. Let me just skip this. So the conclusion from this talk I don't want to conclude anything because nothing could be concluded from these small sessions. I give this lecture, the whole lecture, as two different courses in UMIL. I have one course on chronic disease where we have two weeks spent on chronic disease discussion. I have another course on aging where we also spend two weeks to talk about aging issue. So I don't want to conclude at this point, but I want to pose questions actually for you to reflect. We know that we cannot prevent aging. Certainly, we will grow older, and elderly will be more. But the question to you, can we live healthier? That's quite a big question. It's not a simple question to answer. So I don't expect you to give any answer. Just for you to reflect on your way back. Second question, can we actually prevent death related to chronic disease? If so, by whom, to whom, who should, whom should we target? We know government do not have a lot of money. Governments usually have very limited resources. So when, we, when you become a researcher, when you want to talk to the government, you need to focus. If you say, Minister of Health, let's do something on chronic disease. And the minister will say, what are we supposed to do? And you will say, let's do tobacco cessation. The minister will say, I give you 100 million to do this. Then you scratch your head, How, what can I do with 100 million? Isn't it? We will not get a lot of money. Primary health care will not get a lot of money. So you have to focus. You need to know where to target. Who are the high risk people to smoke? Then you need research. You need to look for evidence. Where should you target your efforts? Because you, you don't have I mean, endless money to spend. So more research are needed. And I hope that you are challenged. I don't want to ask the question. I know that all of you are challenged to do something for the populations. And by that, actually welcome you to Yumi University. If you're interested to do student exchange, there have been some international, uh, not international, actually regular students who have been to Yumi as exchange student for two months in pediatric and obstetrics. And of course, when you finish your medical degree, if you are more interested in public health, you can come and take our master public health program. And this is how it looks in, in winter, on the 3rd of January 2013, when I took this photo, just outside the Perpustakaan. So you can enjoy having your lunch with some instant ice. So <laughs> you don't need to buy. This is free. These are all free. If you want, you can carry some syrups and then pour on it and then start your desserts. OK, by that, I close this session. And thank you very much for listening. And I hope you are inspired with these topics. Okay.